Hi, I'm Andrew Tsao. In this online edition of Backstory, we'll be previewing Yank Tanks, a film about a fascinating element of Cuban culture. Director and cinematographer David Schendel introduces us to people who own, treasure, and indeed love American cars from the 1950s. So, David, welcome to Backstory. And Good to be here. Here's where I want to start with this. As I watched the film, I thought to myself, classic American cars, Cuba, and then David Schendel. How did this story come to pass? What are you doing there yeah. in Havana with this story? Well, first of all, um, I was there legally. Let's get that out of the okay. way. <laughs> okay. Right off the bat. Um, the first time I went, it's an interesting story. The first time I went down was with my brother. My brother is a um, surgeon at Stanford, and he does humanitarian missions all over Latin America. One of the places he went was Cuba. Okay. And he had just recently set up a medical foundation to continue his work in Latin America. He hired my production company to wow. go to Havana with him to do um, like little web episodes sure. for his website, for his sure. foundation. And um, we were sitting there at the Hotel Nacional watching, watching these beautiful cars, sipping mojitos, and I was thinking, you know, I don't think the general pu public is going to be that interested in watching um, cleft palate surgery. Yeah, Maybe okay. we should think of something that, you know, since we have this carte blanche here in Cuba yeah. that we can shoot wherever we want right now, let's think of some, some other idea. Immediately we thought, well, let's, what about the cars? So they're literally, part uh, they're, they're lined up there as Oh, yeah. Yeah. Wow. They use them as taxis. So, I mean, and Steven said, you know, that's not a bad idea. We have, we, we had the permit for a year. Yeah. And, uh, so I immediately took a couple of days off and went out and just started interviewing um, some of the people that were in the cars, the taxi drivers, people that were just hanging out. Yes. They love to show the cars off. Yeah. It's, like, it's like a pony show. I mean, really, they drive them out there, they park them on the street, and they stand by them. Right, and right, right. Gl this glowing look on their face. Right. So um, we ended up getting about an hour's worth of material out of that trip, which I then cut down. And okay. we took that to investors and said, hey, don't you think this would be a great documentary? Also did a little bit of research to make sure that the, the topic hadn't been covered already. And I was pretty surpri surprised to find out it hadn't been. Yeah, yeah. And that, you know, there'd been like little news magazine things done on it five, I ten I minutes. I, I think I saw a National Geographic photo essay once about some of the preserved things for America and some of the cars, but never a film that went into the, the world of it. Yeah. Um, that's, that's, that's a pretty unique view of something that's like essentially preserved from a time when, you know, there was a, a Cuba that was a, a member of the world community and connected to America and then... And, and a great trading partner. Yes, Really exactly. great trading partner of ours. Exactly. Let me, let me ask you this. Um, these cars and the people who love them, care for them, invest a huge amount in them, it represent a time and place. I mean, it's spoken about in your film. Yeah. And documentary filmmaking itself is about preserving a time and place. I mean, in essence, you have captured their stories and preserved them and, and, and shared them with us. And there's a lot of references in the film to, you know, what will happen to these cars when the embargo lifts and such and such. Can you reflect a little bit up on about being a documentary filmmaker and the idea of documenting something as a story? And, you know, this whole idea of preservation and representation and story as you thought through how to put this film together. Well, I'll tell you, I think that that period of time is already gone. Yeah. We're not in the 50s anymore. Yeah. The cars are more like a talisman to kind of transport us into Cuba. Okay. And that's very much just the surface layer of this film. Right. The other, the other kind of excuse that it gave us was to explore the Cuban culture. And in, in a more deeper sense, to explore what the embargo has done to this culture. Mm -hmm. What happens when a, when a society is effectively cut off from the rest of the world. Right. And a thriving metropolitan society nonetheless, not a third world country. Mm -hmm. uh, what happens when, you know, when that kind of barrier goes up to yeah. you and your neighbors? Um, and so we explored that. The cars, I think, were a great kind of example of that because you know, they can't get spare parts. And that's something we see that's pretty remarkable uh, in the film. This, uh, as you say, there's, an, there's a pretty potent subtext to uh, sort of the spirit of invention uh, when you are cut off from yeah. the world. Um, talk to us a little bit about how you built the relationships you did in a culture uh, that I assume is not your heritage. 
Right. Uh, and clearly the people you were talking to were very happy to share their enthusiasm. And beyond that, they shared some pretty frank opinions about their social, political, and economic state. They felt pretty comfortable with you, David. What was that like getting to know them? What, what was the process like to get them yeah. to be so comfortable? That's interesting. Um, I'm facing that very much in my, my new documentary as mm -hmm. well, is the idea of trust and, and, and trust between a subject mm -hmm. and a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. Huge issue. And it's not like you could just walk in there and get that. You know, you really have to work on it. We went down there several times to Cuba to gain this trust, mm -hmm. to let people know what we were doing. Mm -hmm. um, Javier Bahana, who was the interviewer yes. and the kind of the host of the show, was very good about that. He had been, he's been in Cuba for, for years and years and years and working for um, the Japanese uh, television news station okay. that, that reports from Havana. There. So he had a relationship, well, at least with the community, not with those the community, individu individuals. Yeah, yeah. But people knew of him, yes. at least at the government level. So we didn't have people trailing us. We weren't taking on, you know, yeah, yeah. The, the dotted line tour. We were allowed to roam freely and find the story. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But that n wasn't nearly enough because because even then, you just never know. I mean, maybe it helped that I was American and people are, you know, unlike what, what the, the myth is, mm -hmm. we are not enemies. People love Americans. They, mm -hmm. they thought it was so cool that here I was in these small neighborhoods where Americans usually didn't go. Yeah. And, the, and at first I was an oddity and they were like, oh, well, what's this guy doing here? Mm -hmm. With a camera. With Look, a camera. Looking at my car. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and talking to my daughter. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, it, was, yeah. It, it got a little dicey several times, but I mean, you know, we, Javier was there, the crew was there who was all Cuban. And um, trust was initially established, and then we would go back each subsequent visit over okay. this period of this year, sometimes bringing some gifts. You know, Cubans need mm -hmm. basic necessities. Mm -hmm. And when mm -hmm. I'm saying basic, I'm talking toilet paper and toothpaste. Okay. And, you know, you. you get a little bit of gratitude, people open up to you, they realize you're not a, a government spy or CIA mm -hmm. or something like that or trying to ruin their lives. And you really are just talking about the cars, you know, the cars. Yeah, and that's sort Using of Using it the as a metaphor. Uh, yeah, and they have such a relationship with them, but it was also clear that they understood that, as you said, the cars were a portal, a threshold, a sign of something else. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that's fascinating, and it's, it's wonderful how... how using this idea of caring for something that you literally have to care and take care of like a child now because you can't just order the parts, yeah. opens up that world. You have to make the parts. Yeah, exactly. You have to hand tool them. Yeah. If you can't, you know, and that's the most fascinating thing, I think, for me about the film, other than, the, and then the irony of these huge <laughs> symbols of American freedom, I know. you know, kind of encased in this communist world. Yeah. That, the most fascinating thing was the resilience and the, the entrepreneurship and the inventiveness of the Cuban culture to be able to, especially the mechanics, to be able to make these cars yeah. run yeah. with nothing. Yeah. It also lends quite a striking visual uh, feel to the film itself, just the line and the, the enjoyment of the vehicles. Yeah, it was a blast to shoot. Um, to let's take a look at the trailer for Yank Tanks.
David, a mechanic in the film says, when something ends, I invent something else. And now he, of course, was talking about the problem of parts and how they went about in the film, as we saw, manufacturing them essentially from scratch. This attitude, this way of life is something we just don't have access to. What did you learn in this experience about the Cuban people in this situation making Yank Tanks? Well, I mean, first of all, I think, I think that, that we do. I think we do have, we have um, a similar resourcefulness as mm -hmm. Americans, I think. I think as a culture, um, the Cubans and the Americans are very much similar. I mean, we are entrepreneurs. We are inventors. Mm -hmm. We um, will find a way yeah. to make it work if it's not working. Um, and I think that if you look back at our culture, you know, World War II is a good example. I mean, rationing. Yeah metal, aluminum, I mean, you couldn't, you know, you couldn't find aluminum products. I mean, everything was going into the war effort. I think that we've been there before. Yeah. Um, and I think that, you know, that the entrepreneur entrepreneurial spirit is still very much a part of the American culture. As it applies to Cuba is a very interesting thing because they've been, I mean, their resources are very slim. Mm -hmm. um, as you saw in the film, they go into dumps and they'll mm -hmm. find scrap metal, mm -hmm. and they will make the scrap metal into something. Mm -hmm. Nothing is wasted in this mm -hmm. society. Mm -hmm. There just isn't a place for waste. It's all got a secondary use, a, a third use. It, it all is, is recycled. Mm -hmm. But it's not recycling, it's not, it's not recycling by choice. It's, it's kind of, it's recycling because of the embargo. They just can't get stuff. Right. Um, and that even goes to the medical level. I mean, they reuse syringes. They sterilize syringes and reuse them. I mean, they reuse the rubber gloves you know, for, for the surgery. The I mean, you yeah, know, when you think of it at that level. They have to find a way to make sure that everything that they're doing serves somehow a function to its fullest. Yeah. There, there's the, I guess what I was sort of connecting to was our, even though we're resourceful, you know, we are seen as a consumer and disposable society. Yeah, yeah. Right? And I, I sensed in the film this culturally different attitude of what disposable means. I mean, one of the most powerful moments in the film, just, just to observe it, was this man making the asbestos brake pads Ooh. by hand and, in the, and yeah, later in the film. Shoot. Yeah, that and when a... he says, he, you know, clearly he goes, look, I know the dangers of what I'm doing, but I must do it or I don't survive. Yeah. It, it, it was a very, very powerful thing. And, and the other thing about them is they also had a very sort of sometimes whimsical, sometimes very serious take on their relationship to their government. And the word that was thrown around a lot that I tried to get my hands on was cubanismo. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and can you help me with that concept? Because they, they, oh, yeah, they yeah. tried to describe sure, it. And <laughs> sure. uh, it's a big word. <laughs> yeah, I could tell. It's a yeah. big word, but as, as it's being used in that context yes. in the film, what it means is the Cuban way. The Cuban way. It's like the Cuban way. And in that you know? context, it was off the, the issue of trying to figure out how to navigate some of the bureaucracy and who you had yeah. to maybe bribe or look exactly. the other way. So that's part of the Cuban way, is navigating the back channels of things? That's, uh, that's one of the, the, yeah, the black market definitely would be Cubanismo. Okay. It would be, it would be figuring out a way to get, get beyond obstacles and get it done. Okay. I mean, I had one Cuban, um, one of my wonderful best friends down there tell mm. me that uh, <laughs> the Cubans have three undeniable rights. And this is definitely an example of Cubanismo. Their three undeniable rights are education, health care, and stealing from the government. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> you know. All right, all right. So it's understood that yeah. this relationship is adversarial, but it's, it's, uh, it's almost an accepted way of life. Everyone yeah. grows up understanding this relationship. Without it, everything would stop moving right. down there. I mean, if, right. if, if they didn't get an extra scrap metal from the, the government cars that they worked on, yes. then the taxis wouldn't run. Yeah. You know, the government can't give them this uh, stuff directly. So there's, well, yeah, yeah. you know, shh, don't tell it. And the other interesting part of it is I think that they, they just, Cubanismo. Yeah, yeah. They, uh, they uh, get it done. You know. And, the, and they, they have businesses. They have licensed small businesses. This film was the first one to, to show that, you know, under this socialist 
capitalist system, yeah. they have small businesses. Entrepreneurship and they are is encouraged, and, encouraged, and, yeah. and uh, they make their way. Mm -hmm. You know, the film also does a lovely job. Uh, we mentioned this in our talk earlier about um, using this idea of these classic cars in a time warp, if you will, as a portal into the life of the Cuban people today. But in the film also, there's talk about what happens when. Uh, there was references to, well, what would happen when the embargo ends, and particularly to the cars themselves. And at one point, one of the characters late in the film, sitting around, says, to have a vehicle is to have freedom. Mm. And, you know, it struck me because when I thought of these cars and I thought of the American vehicle and I thought of the iconography of it for us, the open road, freedom, individuality, mm. and the irony of the Cuban obsession with these American icons, Amazing. and then their own thinking about their future. Um, talk to us a little bit about what you see coming next from your time there, uh, and what you learned from them about their view of what will come when change finally arrives in Cuba. Uh, they are a very well-educated society. Mm -hmm. Castro has done that right. They have the um, lowest illiteracy rate in all of the Americas, and that's including our country. Wow. Um, they have the best access to health care. So their socialist system has done them right in certain ways. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's not all negative. Mm -hmm. um, I think that when the embargo ends, there's going to be a massive rush of lawyers onto the island, probably, to try to reclaim lost land. Hmm. And it's going to be um, an ugly battle hmm. when people try to reclaim their houses that they mm -hmm. had back in 59 when mm -hmm. the embargo mm -hmm. went up and mm -hmm. they had to leave. I think there's going to be that property rights issue is going to be a very ugly chapter okay. in Cuban history. Um, but again, the people are, s are smart, they're resilient, they're creative, um, and they are Cuban, and, and there is nothing like Cuban pride. I mean, mm -hmm. they, are, they have such a national pride. I mean, as you saw in the film, yes. got, we cannot be sunk. Yes. We're Cuba. Right. You know, you can try, right. but... Right. So there's that adhesiveness that's in that society that yeah. will hold it together. Um, my fear is that it will become more like Puerto Rico, and, and, you know, there'll be a real rift between rich and poor, mm -hmm. and, and that might happen. Um, I'd like to see it personally become more of a like a maybe a Swedish system I mm -hmm. think that would do them well like a social dem democracy where they can maintain some of their social structures that they've built that work so well there in that island um, but have an open democracy yeah. where they can elect their officials they yeah. can they can do business with the world they can you know make money and okay. that would be my hope for them and what do you think is going to happen to these cars then boy that's a big question man mm -hmm. I wish I could I mean, there look was into my crystal ball well and there, see it, there, there were the couple stories of the people who came and offered huge sums of money but but yeah, could not yeah. take them out of the country but if they were to be able to be exported to museums and where I would imagine the value would just explode explode right? I mean there's there's some cars there that there's only three or four left of in the world um, what's going to happen I think is this Castro's government right now has got basically you cannot export any cars. They're considered a national treasure. Okay. Um, which is another huge irony yeah, if yeah, you think yeah, about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Yes, American it's 50s cars. It's are crazy. National treasure, I mean, yeah. they were, with the Harley Davidsons that they had down there were all put in big pits and covered with dirt after the revolution. They couldn't do that with the cars. They needed them. They needed them. So, um, when the embargo is, is ended, and I, and I hate to, like, you know, I'm not, I don't project things, mm. I don't try to predict the future, but I think what's going to happen is, a lot of them will be bought and sold mm -hmm. and probably exported to museums. Mm -hmm. um, if someone could help them mm -hmm. create a real viable auto museum right. or some kind of subsidization of yeah. keeping those cars there, it would yeah. be brilliant, it would well, be wonderful. Well, also the skills they've developed in maintaining and caring for them, it seems would, would, it would be terrible to waste that love, yeah, that, that clear love thing. for it. That's the other thing. Those kind of craftsmen are very oh. hard to find. Yeah. And it's almost like someone should start a, a craft school it's down there and them, have people yeah, yeah. Te have, you know, these guys teach Edo, teach how to, how do you do chrome work? Exactly. I mean, you know, so that's it what would I be thought. brilliant if they could do that. I, I think it, it should be done because those kind of hands-on crafts are very yeah. quickly disappearing from our world. Well, David, I want to thank you for being with us yeah. on Backstory. It was, it was absolutely really fascinating.
piece and uh, boy, look forward to seeing what happens. And t just give, give us a taste of what's coming next for you before we leave. Um, finishing up my next full, full length documentary. Okay. Um, the working title right now is The Comedy Club and it's about the legendary Cobb's Comedy Club oh, in San Francisco, great, great. which has been around for 25 years and we've got performances by Bill Maher, Bob Saget, Dana Carvey, and, and interviews with them as well. So Excellent. It should be Excellent. another kind of interesting look into a, a different craft uh, other than yeah. ours. Okay. Thanks, David. Thank you. And I don't want to thank you for being with us here on Backstory. I'm Andrew Tsao, and I'll see you behind the scenes soon. Thank you.